Hello and welcome to Attacking Third and Title Nine Tuesdays. I'm Sandra Herrera, joined today as always by Lisa Roman. We've chatted already with a handful of incredible women who are true game changers in their fields. And today we're lucky to be joined by one of the most elite athletes in the world. She's uh, from CBS Sports Network's We Need to Talk. She's a tennis double specialist, won 20 career double titles, reached quarterfinals or better at all four Grand Slam events, is also a tennis executive, first black and youngest person ever to serve as president, chairman, and CEO of the United States Tennis Association. And we are so excited to welcome Katrina Adams to the show. Welcome to Attacking Third, Katrina. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Just a couple of uh, Chicago gals getting ready to chat about Title IX things. I was so excited to, to have you on as a guest in our show. We got to choose guests on the show when talking about Title IX and talking about all kinds of sports. It was it was important for us to, to make sure that we you know got women on the show who've experienced a lot of different things, even those who have experienced the firsts of things when they're talking about uh, their careers and the things that they've accomplished. So in, in talking about Title IX and celebrating the 50th anniversary of the law in your own words, what is Title IX? What has it meant to you? I mean, Title IX has been everything to me because I'm a recipient of it. I was, I got a college scholarship at Northwestern University and played on the team for a couple of years before I turned pro. Um, and so many other fortunate girls and, and young ladies have had the opportunity to really pursue their dreams in college, playing college athletics. Um, trying to be on equal ground with, with the men's athletics program. We're far from being on equal ground with the men's programs in, in so many ways, but yet we've come so far. And, you know, it's 50 years. I mean, imagine that only 50 years ago, we had that opportunity. I, I know so many people, so many women who played sports that wanted to be able to, to compete and represent their colleges and universities that just weren't able to. So, here we are 50 years later. Uh, we've made a lot of progress, but we still have a long way to go. We do. And, and we'll get your thoughts on that for sure about what more is to come. But over these last 50 years, um, you mentioned it, you benefited from Title IX playing at Northwestern to Grand Slams um, and as an executive. How has Title IX specifically changed the sport of tennis? You know, tennis has been one of those fortunate sports that have really fought for equality and really kind of been at that level since its inception. I mean, Billie Jean King, um, you know, 50 years ago, 52 years ago, and co-founding the WTA was uh, an amazing opportunity for us players, you know, that, that the generations after her and others that had that opportunity. Um, you know, we've always fought for equal rights, for parity, for equal pay. And, you know, from the Grand Slam perspective, since 1972, the U.S. Open offered equal prize money. Um, the Open era started in 1968. So just a few years later, they offered equal prize money. But just, you know, 20 years ago, did Wimbledon step up to the plate mm -hmm. or 10 years ago did Wimbledon step up to the plate to have equal prize money. And on the Grand Slam level, it's there. Um, the WTA just announced their new title sponsor of the tour um, today, which is awesome because that really elevates their presence and prestige in professional sports by having a title sponsor. And, and so we in our sport continue to be the leaders in this space, but yet we've, uh, you know, we've had some of our counterparts in, in other sports lean on women's professional tennis, lean on Billie Jean King, um, to be their voice, um, to fight for parity. And um, it's amazing how much progress we have made. But again, there's still so far to go in, in so many other sports. It's good to be a, the trailblazer in that sense and be the pillar for other sports and organizations to lean on. I mean, where I'm leaning on you today for information and knowledge and stories about it. Um, in, in your career, Katrina, you've ac achieved incredible, incredible things. I mean, 20 W2A doubles titles um, at Northwestern, right? Like Big Ten champion, NCAA doubles champion, two-time All-American as an athlete and as a, a female tennis player. Were these your goals as, as a young Chicago Chicago girl? You know, tennis was very different um, back in the 70s when I was a junior um, and early 80s when, when I went into high school and understanding what professional tennis was. I always thought I could be a professional, but I didn't know what that meant because I wasn't really raised in that environment that 
you know, today you can watch tennis on Tennis Channel 24 seven. So every child understands what tennis is on the highest level and, and being on television. Yeah, I saw tennis on television only during the Grand Slam season or every few weekends out of the year when they would televise the semis or finals. And so I didn't really have that, but I knew inside I was such a competitor. I love to compete. I love to win. Um, and I knew there was another level. So going to college was always a goal of mine. My parents were teachers. I didn't have a choice in that either. Um, but, you know, I'm from Chicago, grew up watching Northwestern, you know, on, on television and sports, understanding their program. I wanted to go into communications. They had the top communications program in the nation. So that was kind of a no brainer for me and a huge opportunity when I was recruited. But to go further on the professional tour, I had to navigate and figure out what that meant. But once I was there, you know, I knew I belonged. I knew that um, it was a spot for me. It was, you know, I'd earned my way to be there. To one sport, you have to earn it. You don't get drafted. You have to earn it to, to get to the highest level based on your results. And so as I got involved on the tour, I got involved on the Players Association Board of Directors because I wanted to do more. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to make sure that we were the greatest sport, the greatest sport for women, um, you know, globally, and, and that we were, and we continue to be that today. I want to keep some of this, this energy that you just hit us with right now. I want to maybe take the conversation in a little bit of a different direction, but what I feel is maybe a more important, uh, you know, direction when the world sees some, see someone, you know, whether it's a woman, a person of color, young person uh, out there achieving things, it, it makes it feel like it's more attainable. But for you, Katrina, you, you were the, the first of so many, you were, you know, for young black, woman to be so many things in, in this specific space, president, CEO, chairman of, you know, UTA, former player, youngest African-American woman. What, what were some of the, the challenges that you faced as sort of, you know, being that, that first of, of all those things? It's a very interesting question because I think, you know, as I grew up and, and really propelled through the sport, I was often the only one, the only girl, only black girl, you know, at the tournament or at this club or, or what have you. And so it was, unfortunately it was normal. And, and so as I got older, older, I started to understand the impact and what that meant. Because when you're a kid, you don't get it. You know, you don't understand it. If no one's really talking to you about the significance of it, of which when you're a child, no one does because they don't want to bring that, that attention to you and, and making you maybe feel a little the pressure that there really is. But as you get older and I started to go into these different other arenas, um, particularly as a head of the USTA, and it was talked about over and over and over again, I started to really understand the impact of, wow, this is really big. This is huge. This is different. This is impactful. This is empowering. And, and so when I finally allowed myself to inhale and, and, and take a grasp of it, then I understood what my responsibility was and how I really needed to rise to that next level because you have to see it to believe it. And you know, I was the first uh, person of color, first black to be there in 135 year history of our organization. That said a lot. And so now as I look, you know, that was 2015 through 18, here we are four years later, you know, when is the next one going to be there? Hopefully soon. I was only the fourth woman in, the, in, that, in that span as well. The first one coming on in 1999. So from 1999 to 2015, I was just the fourth woman. Uh, I do think that there is um, growth and, and change in the next, you know, over the next decade for more women and more people of color to be the president there. But it, I understood my responsibility. I understood the impact that I had on the next generations of saying, wow, this is a sport for me. Wow, this is something that I want to do. If she can do it, I can do it too. And, and that's the message that I continue to parlay today. What advice do you have for young girls or, or women um, that are looking to do something, break into a space, try something, but they don't see anyone that looks like them, uh, whether it's male, female, black, white, what advice do you have for them? 
the first thing is understand what your goals are and why you have them. You know, what is your intent? What is your purpose? Um, and then own them, you know, own your courage, you know, step out on that limb and, and take that chance because if you don't, someone else will. And it's okay to be the first. The first doesn't mean that you're the last and that's up to you. That's your responsibility to make sure that you're not the last and that you're not the only one, that you're reaching back and pulling someone forward. You know, own your voice, go after what you want. What is it that you really want to achieve? What is it that you're really trying to relay? And own your identity. I mean, it, it's, I'm proud to be a black woman and particularly from the West side of Chicago. So you got to own that identity and understanding that you, first of all, stand on the shoulders of those that came before you. And now you want to be those shoulders that someone else can stand on to propel you forward. And if you can do those things, you can own the possibilities and then ultimately own your arena, the title of my book. You know, when I hear you speak about this, right? First of all, everybody go get the book. Second of all, when I hear you speak about all this and sort of this, this kind of making this transition to the advice from thinking about how you're going to impact the next generation. But even if we talk about this current generation in place, when you're thinking about breaking those barriers, right, through the, these various moments of your career and becoming not just the first, but a very successful tennis player, CEO, president, et cetera. How did, how did people's perception of you, do you think maybe change after being in those powerful positions? Because there's always that, the, the way maybe you present yourself to somebody else, right? There's, you're opening yourself up to the perception of someone else of you. And maybe that could be someone else that isn't representative of you, whether they're not a, a woman or a woman of color. And I hear you say having these, these dreams, right? As, as a young black girl, you know, from the West side of Chicago. And then, you know, I'm getting to sit here and interview you as a, as a, as a Latina from the South side of Chicago. And it's just sort of hearing these things like coming full circle almost. What, what, what is, how do you feel that you sort of keep all these things together in the front of your, your mind, your heart, wherever, while trying to change perceptions? Well, I think, you know, I was very lucky in, in, in my arena of sport. Um, I was highly respected. You know, everyone knew me. I was a commentator. I still commentate. So pretty, a, a pretty much a fresh face, face, if you will, in the sport. Um, I was always at tournaments, you know, either re, um, doing commentating or in other meetings in different committees that I might have been on over the years. And for me, I kept those relationships going. I kept that network, you know, alive for me. And so once I got to that level, not even ever thinking that that's what I would be doing, you know, 10 years prior, it was because I had built that foundation of respect and of loyalty um, and honor, if you will. And so when I did get to the height um, and get to the top, then I already had that respect from my peers in the sport. But it, what it did is allowed other people that were just recognizing and getting to know me a chance to say, wow, she's awesome. Wow, she rocks. Wow, she gets it. Wow, she gets me. Wow, she represents me. And, and, and that was really what my ultimate goal was, was to make sure that people saw me for who I am as a Black woman, but also saw me as that leader that I became in that voice of the sport that embraced all. So you couldn't say that that sport is not for me because if I'm at the top and I'm that voice, then you can say, wow, that is a sport for me. I want to learn more about that sport. I want to get better. I want to figure out how to elevate on the business side of sport now, because now I, I'm seeing it. So I actually believe it. You have to see it to believe it in so many different um, instances in, in business and whatever that position might be. And so I was very proud to, to be in that role, um, to be that representative and, you know, and to make a difference. Diversity of thought is key in everything we do in every aspect of business. And if you don't have the diversity of thought in the room that can really talk about or come from a different perspective and make people understand that your way is not the only way and it's not the way that it should be. We have to make sure that we are branching out and being a lot more inclusive. But if you don't have someone like me in the room to really share those, those ideas and thought and knowledge, then 
you're not going to be your best. And I, I have a, a recollection of being in a meeting where I was the only woman in a board meeting um, of a different company. And, you know, everyone's sharing their thoughts and, and they're expressing their beliefs and concerns. And, and so I let them speak. And then I spoke up. And, you know, one of the guys looked at me and goes, hmm, thank you for sharing your wisdom. I would have never looked at it that way. So I leaned forward. I said, of course not. You're not a woman. And so, you know, that cartoon, they go, huh? yeah. that was the look that everyone had. And then they were all kind of like chuckled, like, yeah, you're right. And, and it was like a wake up moment for them to say, wow, we are so lucky to have you in here because we would never look at it that way. And, and if we can get business as a whole to recognize the value that we as women bring to the table or people of different races, ethnicities bring to the table, then we'd be a much better place. They respected your opinion. They honored it. They wanted it and celebrated it based on the reputation you had created for yourself over the years to be respected and honored and, and celebrated. But before you had that reputation, before you had all that honor, uh, maybe even while you still have it, were there moments that you faced gender discrimination or when you spoke up and your voice wasn't as accepted as it was in that instance? Always. I mean, that's, that's not, and that's not going to change. So the, the, what I learned, though, is to make sure that you have an advocate in the room that's on your side that you can trust and, you know, and, and really relay with and say, listen, I'm going to, this is the direction I'm going to go later today in our meeting. And I'm going to bring up this topic. And if for whatever reason I get overlooked, can you bring it back full, you know, full force? And, and so I've had that happen and, or I've been in situations where I have shared something, a thought, an idea and, you know, they go, oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. That's great. That's nice. And then they go on to something else. Right. And then about 10 minutes later, a male will kind of say what I just said in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I'll say for hypothetically hypothetical name, I'll go, Oh my gosh, Jeff, thank you for bringing that back up. Because as I was saying about 10 minutes ago, this was, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right. So it was my way of kind of slapping everybody in the room saying, yeah. that's my idea. You're not going to overlook or the person that you had entrusted earlier will say, you know what, let's go back to what Kat said about X or about Y, because I really think that's a great idea. And then I go, oh yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, of course, of course. So you have to take control of your voice and make sure that you're heard, you're not overlooked, um, but make sure that when you do speak, when, you're, when you have something to share, that it is impactful um, and that it is empowering and it will stop them in their tracks because we are often sharing things that they would never think about in a room full of men. I'm taking notes. I'm taking yeah. notes for my own personal life here. Thank you. Yeah, same. Let's let's stay with that a little bit. As as a leader, as as someone who has been the head of of leadership in in many rooms, I'm sure the leader of so many different conversations as well. Uh, how would you maybe, or what sort of differences would you point out in terms of your leadership style, and maybe when you look at it compared to you know other leaders that you've had to maybe share these same rooms with, whether it's male coworkers or or, or other uh, women in uh, positions of leadership. Yeah, I think the most important thing is that when you establish yourself as a leader and you have your vision and you have everyone on board that is striving to accomplish that um, and to be successful towards the vision and the mission, whatever that might be, then you have to empower your staff to be the leaders that they are. That's why they have senior titles, et cetera. Um, I'm not one, I'm not a micromanager. I, I'm not a dictator. Um, you know, I really allow my, my senior leadership team to shine and, and let their work shine. And I'll often say, you know, I can't take the credit for this. It's, these are the people that did all the work and these are the people that really rose to the occasion and collectively we were able to succeed. Um, and so that's, you know, that's just the way that I work. Um, I don't like to take full credit for anything because I'm not the one ultimately that has done the work. I've done the, uh, I've given the advice, I've, I've given the pathway, but if you don't let your, your team shine, then you're not allowing them to be their best selves. 
And so if you're not allowing them to be their best selves, then why do you have them? I love that. You know, what we've been doing to sort of close out these uh, Title IX segments for Title IX Tuesdays here on Attacking Third, we've sort of closed out with a little bit of maybe of, of, a, of a, ref a reflective question uh, in, in terms of the celebrating of 50 years, right? We've come a long way in the last 50 years in terms of something like gender equality, but there's always work to be done, right? How, how much further do you personally feel like we need to go and what are your own hopes or dreams for the next 50 years? But we have a we have a long way to go, and we, let's look at let's stay in the sports realm of things and and the leadership realm of things. We don't have enough women in leadership positions. I mean, if you look at all the sports, right? We've got Kim Ng in MLB, the only one um, in the leadership role there. Um, in the NFL, our our female leaders are relatives of deceased owners or daughters of the owners, right? MBA, they're daughters of the previous owners. So until we can actively hire our women to be in these leadership roles in sport, doesn't matter what sport it is, it's business. We know business, right? And we also know sports, but it's about making the right decision, business decisions for these leagues and organizations more so than making decisions for these male athletes who think that we can't think for them. Cause it's not about them. It's about the business at the end of the day. Yes, it's about the athletes, but the business of the athletes for us to be able to be in these leadership roles. So that's what I would love to see more of. Um, you know, we, we, we have this new league athletes unlimited that is a, a women's sports league and the women and the, these athletes are ba basically part owners of the league and they are making the decisions and how things are changing, how they're growing. You know, it's a, a league that started with softball and now they have um, volleyball lacrosse and then they just added basketball and who knows what else is gonna come. But these are opportunities for our female athletes to continue to pursue their, their dreams and their goals and, and also help prepare them for the business world afterwards. So. We need more of those athletes unlimited type um, thinkers uh, and the mindset of the world for us to really be able to get to where we should ultimately be. More women in sports, more women in spaces. Let's uh, let's end on that. Uh, Katrina Adams, I want to thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing some of your story. We also always like to thank our listeners. So thanks everyone for joining along on the conversation. You can follow us on Twitter at Attacking Third for more. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you listen to your podcast shows. We're also available as video. Subscribe, visit youtube.com slash attacking third. And we'll be back next Tuesday with more Title IX Tuesday coverage. For Sandra Herrera, Lisa Roman, and Katrina Adams, this was Attacking Third.